when we're talking about nutrients, all of these discussions should be framed in terms of bioavailability. How much of that nutrient can you actually get out of that plant? Let's just think about spinach. When you're eating spinach, do you think, are you eating it because you're like, I'm getting a certain mineral out of it or a vitamin or something? I'm eating it because I do think that there are some, some, some nutrients to it but I also think that there's fiber in it. So spinach is actually a really interesting one because spinach is very don't, high. Don't, in don't, no, 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 don't oxalates. ruin my life. You're gonna ruin my life. <laughs> oxalates, knowledge is power, you're welcome. No, it's actually really high in oxalates. Most kidney stones in the world, I think 80% are calcium oxalate kidney stones. Where do we get oxalate? We get oxalate from things like almonds, spinach, rhubarb, beets, beet greens, very high in oxalates. So chocolate also is pretty high in oxalates. Jen, we need to end this interview. It's over. <laughs> That's what I'm, I'm talking done. about. I'm I told done. you. Hi, welcome to the Pretty Intense Podcast. On the show today is Dr. Paul Saladino. I stumbled onto Paul on social media looking at, you know, different diets. I'm always seeking for the next health thing. And uh, he popped up and he eats a carnivore diet. He has a podcast called The Fundamental Health Podcast. He also has a book called Carnivore Code. He's a double board certified medical doctor. I'm on this quest to understand really like at our root, what should we as human beings be eating? And then also what are the root causes of um, illness and of disease? You're gonna have to take notes on this one. There's a, or, or just listen for what the good and the bad things are to eat according to him. Um, because unfortunately he totally puts vegetables on blast. So this is a real deep dive into what what foods you should and shouldn't be eating and why. Let's just say uh, I'm going to change my diet for a while. It's always a little bit challenging when you change your diet to adapt it to your lifestyle, but if it makes you feel that much better or look that much better, whatever you're trying to achieve, isn't it worth it? Um, so I'm excited to try it out for myself. Fascinating, fascinating episode. A lot of thought provoking ideas when it comes to what you put in your mouth and how you feel. Um, I hope you get a lot out of it. Um, I'll keep you all posted. I'll let you know how this diet goes for me. Um, we're, we're just beginning. So if you like this episode, please hit subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. Let me know in the comments what you thought. And also as it goes on, maybe chime back in and I'll look back at the comments and see like, does this work for people or who's doing it? Are you are you out there already doing it? Did you find good benefits already? I'd love to know and I'd love to read it. So um, enjoy the episode. I see your lifestyle, obviously, and um, your suntan, which is indicative of your lifestyle <laughs> um, of being outside. And I love being outside. But did you, because you live in Costa Rica, right? So did you move there to literally be able to live that kind of a lifestyle of, certain kinds of food and certain kinds of activities and maybe even p the environment around you and getting out of cities and into nature. Was that literally why you moved there? Pretty much. It was an accident, but when it, when it happened, I embraced it. Uh, I came here in like February of 2021. So about a year and a half ago, mm. I was coming back from Africa and I flew through Washington, DC. So I was in Africa with the Hadza tribe which we can talk about if you want, but I flew back through DC and I couldn't even get to Austin. There was a big storm. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna go somewhere warm. I wanna surf, I haven't surfed enough recently. Costa Rica was high on the list. So I flew down to Costa Rica thinking I was gonna be here for eight days. Eight days turned into a month, a month turned into two. And now I own a house here and I live here full time. It was just so interesting. Like getting up every morning and surfing is grounding, it's sunlight, it's oh, yeah. nature exposure, it's, it's lack of everything, EMF and digital worlds. Oh, met yeah. some really cool people. People have interesting stories here. And then it was like every day I got to be in the sun, which feels so good as a human to just, you think about like the resources that are available to us, different parts of the world. If you live in New York, for instance, you have access to a lot of people and interesting ideas and energy, but certain times of the year, the sun isn't that high. So you don't have like that sun, you know, it's uh -huh. like what, which, which pieces of the bank account are most important. And for me, having like a huge amount of sun available every single day and ocean and warm water, it made the huge difference. And then I found really good sources of food here. It was, yeah, it's totally the way to do it. Mm. So, okay. You touched on you were in Africa and you said we could talk about that. Why were you in Africa? What, what so, got you to Africa in the first place? Well, I was really curious. I really like anthropology. I wish I had studied anthropology in college mm. and I never did. I was chemistry and biology all the way, you know, like super geeky stuff. And I, uh, 
I'd been hearing about this tribe of people called the Hadza over and over and over. And they were this fascinating group of people for me. They were just this tribe that were some of the last remaining hunter-gatherers left on the planet. There's not mm. many left, probably numbering in the thousands of true, close to being hunter-gatherers left on the planet. These are people who don't farm. They just hunt every day and they gather food. They don't even have dwellings that are permanent. They have thatched huts they make and then they break them down. They have camps, they move around this area in Africa called Lake Yasi. Another group in Africa is called the Ikung, which is in Namibia, and Botswana and South Africa. But I couldn't go to those places because of COVID restrictions, but Tanzania was open. So I just decided now is the time. I wanna go visit the Hadza. I've never been to Africa, but I went to Tanzania. You fly into, you know, uh, you fly into right by Kilimanjaro. You go to this town that's right by Lake Yasi. So it's like 20 hours, 26 hours of flight to Africa. Then you have to drive four or five hours from your flight in Kilimanjaro. Then you have to drive another hour and a half every morning through the bush to like find them in the jungle or in the bush. Is not oh, the jungle wow. There. Yeah, in the bush. Yeah. So you're, you're way out there and then you just, it's, it's incredible. Like as soon as we got to meet them, they were super welcoming and they just let you be a part of the tribe. And we got to hunt with them. We got to hang out with them. We sat by the campfire at six in the morning and 7.30 at night. We got to sing with them and just eat with them. I mean, I ate crazy stuff with them. So like, it's just incredible to see like baboon brains. <laughs> mm. Would you do it? Mm. I mean, I'd probably try about anything. It would be, it would be a mind over matter thing. It, it actually was really good. I'd had <laughs> brains. I'd had brains before, so I didn't think it was going to be bad. Afterwards, people were all worried Oh, prions, but there's never been a case of prion disease that actually jumped from. A, What's like prion? A, so prions are, you ever heard of mad cow disease? Yeah. This is like a semi-infectious particle of protein. Mm -hmm. So people have this long debate, are viruses alive? People also debate, are prions alive? Prions are just a piece of protein. It's an amino acid sequence that makes up a protein. And when it gets into your body, it causes other proteins to misfold. So it causes this chain reaction, this oftentimes aggregate reaction in the brain, which can cause protein misfolding and neuronal damage. There's a disease in humans called Crutchfield-Jakob disease, which is associated with certain genetics and certain proteins, and that is a prion disease. And a variant of Crutchfield-Jakob is mad cow disease. So in Britain, a number of years ago, there was an outbreak yeah. of this mad cow disease where by eating the neural tissue, the brain, the spinal cord, or even the meat of some of these cows, people could get infected with this prion. So it caused this huge stir. This mm -hmm. probably is the type of thing that happens in livestock because of crowding, right? Factory farming and the wrong type of treatment of animals. And I think that in this situation, they were actually feeding pieces of cows to other cows. So the reason it was spreading was because the cows were eating other cow parts like waste or compost from other cows. Mm. which is probably not a good idea. Cows probably shouldn't eat other cows, especially if they're in isolation and in these cordoned off, you know, areas where they're in sort of uh, factory farms. So that's prion disease. And people believe that HIV is a virus that probably jumped from primates to humans. So whenever you talk about eating baboon brains, people think like HIV and prions, but um, I'm okay. Yeah. So. <laughs> Okay, so then we're gonna back up a leap to go. Why? Why was it that you felt like this driving force to go to Africa and experience something more primal and something more natural and something that I'm imagining was different than what you were experiencing at home? Was there an impetus? Was there um, something that was that? Were you in a situation that was totally different? Were you? I don't even know what your job was before. Were you sitting at a desk and you're like, screw this, I need to get on my surfboard and I need to go do other things like why did you end up wanting to really go to Africa especially at such an interesting time um and in, in life where everybody is you know scared of everything you're like ah, I need to get out of here have you ever seen the movie back to the future yeah did you ever want to go in the DeLorean did you ever want to go in a time machine dude I always want to go in a time machine I am always wanting to go at all times I want to just like I want to experience this sort of time as an illusion thing and jump timelines and dimensions. And yes, all the time. So this is the closest thing I've ever done to being in a time machine. 
And that's, I think, what's interesting about anthropology and studying groups of people who live differently than we do in 2022. You and I know what it's like to live in New York City or Chicago or California or Texas or Costa Rica in 2022. But what was it like to live in Africa or any of those places 50,000 years ago or 75,000 years ago? And this is the closest that I thought I could get to a time machine. These people, hunter-gatherers that still live on the earth, live so much differently than we live. It's the closest thing to a time machine. It's not a perfect time machine. The DeLorean's broken a little bit. They've been influenced by modern humans, but they actively avoid modernity in their life. They know about cell phones. They see our cell phones. We show them pictures of rhinoceri in cell, on the cell phone and they get all excited and they want to go hunt it, but they don't want to leave their lifestyle. They live the most similarly to the way that humans lived 50 to 75,000 years ago of anyone on the planet right now. And it's, you know, just miles different than we do today. So they're so much closer yeah. to the way that humans lived 75,000 years ago than anything else on the planet, that that was what I wanted to see. Mm. Where do we come from? That's the question that I was looking to answer. Where do we come from? And there are many people who believe that that Hadza are the direct descendants of Homo sapiens. That Homo sapiens, there's different, you know, we don't exactly understand where Homo sapiens arose. And there's a lot of different lineages of uh, Homo, um, the Homo genus. And there's, you know, all sorts of Neanderthals and Denisovans and, you know, different peoples. But Homo sapiens, we believe this, this, that our species arose in this region of Africa. This sort of, um, this, the Old of I Gorge has footprints of pre-hominids that we believe were the predecessors of Homo sapiens. So hmm. many people believe the Hadza are direct descendants of Homo sapiens. And this is perhaps the closest thing we will ever come to understanding where we've been as humans. So what you see there is fascinating. It's just a time machine. And that's the way they, they wear animal skins and they wear shorts that are dirty that missionaries have given them, but they wear animal skins uh, for shirts and they hunt with arrows that they fashion by hand. They use bows that they carve by hand from the trees in their area. And they sh we saw them shoot birds and they you know, obviously killed a baboon with us. And then they make a fire with no lighters you know, they do a, they, they use wood and they essentially, they rub two sticks together. They have a, a, a uh, they have a bow drill type of uh, method and they, they also spin the, they spin the, the wood in their hands and they get mm -hmm. a, they get an ember uh, and they use that on Tinder. They make fire in two minutes or less. They smoke the animal, they burn the hair off. We cut into it and we're eating the organs. And then, so it was just fascinating because one of the questions that is so fascinating to me as a physician is is there a program written into this homo sapien DNA that gives us an idea of the way we're supposed to eat? You know, is there a program? Other animals pretty clearly have species appropriate and species inappropriate diets. Do you have dogs? I do. Yeah, so I have dogs too. And like, I've been around other dogs and, you know, dog farts are a bad thing, but my dogs don't really fart. I never mean, like smell their farts unless... Somebody feeds them something like a cookie or a hot dog bun. I was doing a reel for 4th of July where I was throwing hot dogs in the buns, saying I wasn't a fan of like hot dogs in the buns and ketchup. And of course, bullshit. one of my dogs just- it's bullshit. Yeah, they're bullshit. They're bullshit. <laughs> so the dog just, one of my dogs, whose name is Ribeye, runs into the jungle and just goes, he just goes crazy. He eats those oh, hot dogs. He'll, he'll eat junk food if I give it to him, right? So he'll eat ketchup and hot dogs and he's eating the buns. And then he has horrible gas and he farts all, the, all over the place and his skin doesn't look as good. So this is just a roundabout way of saying that I think that we see this in animals and I think it's really fascinating, but we don't really think about this in humans. Like the question is, is there a species appropriate diet for humans? And that may be as large or as small as we want to define it. Like maybe a species appropriate diet for humans is much bigger than what I'm imagining. But that's what I'm really trying to understand because when I went to medical school, and residency. And before medical school, I was a physician assistant. So I had lots of years of medical training and I sort of did medical school one and a half times. I've been around a lot of the medical world for a long time. Like never was I taught to ask this question, like how the heck is a human supposed to eat? It's almost like we assume we know how we're supposed to eat. But to me, that's the most fascinating question that no one really has figured out an answer to. And then the, the corollary questions are, are different people different? You know, we're all homo sapiens, but is, is you know, is Danica going to eat differently than Paul? Or, you know, is, are some people going to do better with more plants? Are some people going to do better with less, less plants? 
And then the deeper questions for me as a physician that are super fascinating are around how many of the chronic illnesses that we accept as inevitable in humans, whether it's heart disease, dementias, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, neurodegeneration, arthritis, arthritis, whether it's rheumatoid or osteoarthritis, thyroid hormone problems, whatever autoimmune disease or chronic illness you want, diabetes, obesity, how many of these diseases that we accept as inevitable are preventable or reversible totally. if we can align the diet with what our DNA program is program is expecting. Like if there is actually a user manual written into our DNA as humans, into what we are supposed to be eating. Well, what have you figured out? Could you heal humans, right? Yeah, Could you heal I, humans? I mean, I agree. I think this is fascinating. I ask this question all the time too. And I, I test on myself all kinds of things, you know, I mean, probably the worst test I did was trying to eat less animal meat. I mean, I just truly felt bad for the animals. It was an ethics thing. It was a compassion. It wasn't about not liking the taste of it. I mean, freaking love steak, um, love lamb, love duck, love elk, you name it. Like I'll eat all of them. Um, but I started eating, you know, I would have more fish. I would have a little bit of fish at night, but pretty much all plant-based the rest of the day. And then you're substituting. And when you look at the label of some of the bullshit fake meat, I mean, it's terrible. I'm like, wait, what's worse? I don't know. God. And then I roundabout thought about, well, what's the, what's the value of protein? You know, does, do we have to have protein? Do we have to have that much protein? Can we get the protein from uh, in other ways from plants or other things? And so I went through that, but there's no doubt in my mind, there's no doubt that I feel the best on high fat animal, animal meat, no, no doubt. And so I, I abandoned, I I'm totally okay with it. I mean, do I want to see the truck driving down the road? That's full of cows heading to a slaughterhouse. Absolutely not. And I don't, I, I feel so bad. I, was watching a NASCAR race and there's the winner gets a lobster and this thing is gigantic. And I'm just watching it going, Oh, Oh. And my mom, my mom was like, what is it? The lobster? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but I just, I know that it's, you know, it makes me feel better. So what, um, like what has, what tests have you done on yourself? I think you were vegan at some point in time, right? I was vegan about 15 years ago for seven months. I had 20 to 25 pounds less muscle mass on my body. So I'm like a moderately muscled male. And you can imagine me with 20 pounds less muscle. It was really skinny. I couldn't get a date. You know, I would like ask a girl out and she would say, you're too skinny. And that was almost when the light bulb went off evolutionarily. My body is like, you're an idiot. Start eating meat. Like you're never going to procreate or even get to practice if you don't eat some meat, dude, like this girl is saying <laughs> you're too skinny. So I was like, okay, but yeah, I had a horrible vegan phase. It was really bad gas. My GI symptoms were out of control. You couldn't be in the same room with me when I was vegan. Um, and then, you know, and I had my own autoimmune issues. I've had my own autoimmune issues throughout my life. Mine are not as severe as many people's are, but I have eczema and asthma, which is a sort of a family of conditions known as atopy. Uh, these atopic conditions. So I have atopic dermatitis, which is these red itchy bumps that'll come up on my wrists and my elbows and my knees. And when I was in medical school at times, I had eczema so bad, I was doing jujitsu, it would get infected, it would cause impetigo. So that's, it's not a bad thing in general, but it can be a bad thing for a lot of humans. Mm. And people are very self-conscious about their eczema. People can get it on their face yeah. and on their body. It doesn't look good on your skin to have eczema. And asthma is a lung condition, which is fairly serious. And these are autoimmune conditions. Oh. And growing up, my dad is a doctor, he's an internist, my mom is a nurse practitioner, and neither of them were taught to think, is our son eating something that is causing this eczema for him? As a kid, I had this. I had these little itchy bumps, right? I'm eating regular pasteurized dairy, I'm eating processed food. Even though my family is a medical family, we were eating TV dinners, I was eating seed oils, I was eating processed sugars, we'd go to McDonald's. And instead of thinking my incredibly intelligent and super kind father, instead of thinking, maybe we should feed our son differently, they give me inhalers and creams. Right. And it doesn't, this doesn't solve the problem at all. This is kind of the, this is what I've always been trying to figure out for myself and why, I don't know, I think growing up in a medical family, you get fascinated by these questions of how humans can live better. I'm not as much obsessed about living long. I just wanna live well every single day. I want the quality and I'm not willing to sacrifice the quality of my life experience any day for some 
empty promise of longevity, especially when that empty promise of longevity is hard to prove. There's a lot of people out there now saying, if you do this, you'll live longer. Well, it's like, okay, maybe in 70 years, we'll find out if that's true or not, right? And a lot of the things they're saying are like, eat less meat, but then you look at the research, it's not substantiated anyway. So I've been trying to understand for myself, how do I fix my eczema? Because though my eczema would come and go, I knew there was an autoimmune condition going on. There's this subclinical inflammation going on in my body. I don't want this. And multiple dietary interventions. So vegan, horrible gas, super skinny, can't get a date. Then I do paleo, which is meat and vegetables and nuts and seeds. And it's okay, but it still happens. And that's when I was in medical school, having pretty severe eczema flares, having mm. impetigo, having infections of my skin from doing jujitsu and wrestling. And then I go to residency at the University of Washington and I have a really bad eczema flare when I'm experimenting with like uh, medicinal mushrooms, things like reishi and chaga, yeah, yeah. cordyceps, things we, we are told are good for us, I think triggered a massive eczema flare for me. And I kind of kind of get really frustrated and I think, okay, this is, this is ridiculous. Like I need to just huh. get really simple in my diet. So that was the beginning of a carnivore diet for me. The simplest version of this elimination diet mm -hmm. was just meat, and organs like liver and heart and fat and salt. And I did that for two years. And then after I did that, I had to transition to something else because the I ended up with significant issues with my electrolytes because the ketogenic diet didn't work well for me. So a carnivore diet of just meat and organs and fat leads to some pretty serious ketogenic states for a lot of humans. And that led to electrolyte problems for me, palpitations, muscle cramps. Sure. So as I'm going through, I'm trying to learn and correct. A carnivore diet fixed the eczema by cutting out a variety of foods. But then I had to kind of put some foods back in and figure uh -huh. out what I could do that was the best. And that was where I ended up, so basically where I am now, like an animal-based diet, reincorporating things like fruit and honey for carbohydrates. Very curious because I feel like most people would say that, most people would think a carnivore diet is just all meat. Um, and I would have guessed that too, but obviously I've seen what you eat and there's fruit and there's honey and then there's, uh, dairy, there's raw, you know, there's kefir and things like that and lots of butter. So, I mean, I think that could have been considered carnivore, but, um, but yeah, what, um, how long have you been at this diet now? Because one of the other things I would say is, is that in the quest of trying to figure it out, like there are people that go vegan and they feel great for a period of time. And then all of a sudden it just catches up with them. So, you know, I always think of myself as an ongoing process and I'm sure that whatever I'm doing right now, I'll think to myself in 10 years of like, I can't believe I was eating that, you know, um, cause I can look back 10 years from 10 years ago from today and be like, I can't believe I was eating that. And I was doing the best I could. So how long have you been eating sort of adaptive carnivore or what would you give it a different title based on the fact I call it animal-based animal-based. Yeah. And it's, that's been about two to three years now. Mm -hmm. And I get blood work every six months to a year. I just released on my podcast, which is called Fundamental Health, mm. uh, a review of my July 2022 blood work because everybody thinks I'm going to die. Um, they have thought I was going to die since I started carnivores. So I've been well, doing you don't look like you're going to die. So, <laughs> <laughs> but people think like, oh, you're going to get heart disease, right? You're going to get these silent killers. You surely have heart disease or something. And then you show them a picture of your arteries and they're all clear and or you show them a coronary artery calcium scan, which is a zero with no calcium in my arteries. And you say, and look, I'm totally insulin sensitive. I don't think I have coronary artery disease. And they still don't believe you. It's, it's, it's an interesting ongoing conversation. Such cognitive a lot dissonance of around like exclusions of food and things that we were fundamentally taught are important, you know? I mean, just, you know, growing up eating Cheerios, you know? <sighs> yes, I think that, so I want to write a kid's book <laughs> and I want to write, I want to write a kid's book for parents that talks about the basic plot is like your kids don't need to eat vegetables. And I want to do like, whether it's like a cave kid or some kind of, you know, set in the Neanderthal times or some, you know, like 50,000 years ago through the like time the machine. Like the tribe in Africa. <laughs> yes. You know, like the kids in Africa don't eat vegetables. And I want to circle back to the Hadza and tell you about what they eat and what they prioritize. But I want to write a kid's book because I think that you know, I don't have kids, but my sister has a two-year-old and a four-year-old. And, um, you know, I'm not a pediatrician, but I've done enough medical training <laughs> to know that kids don't need to eat vegetables. But we've all been told this is deeply ingrained into every psyche that my mom and my grandma would say, oh, yeah. eat your vegetables. Well, vegetables are better than Snickers bars, but I'm not convinced that vegetables are 
great for humans. And that is one of the more controversial statements that I make with my work. It's not the one that I really want people to get so wrapped around the axle on. I'd rather they start doing their own questioning about their diet. I just want people to think about diet. I want people to cut out processed sugar and seed oils, which we can talk about too. And if they really want to go down the rabbit hole and follow the stuff I'm working on, then you can worry about vegetables and whether you include them in your diet or not. But I just, I want to write this kid's book that says like, you know, Charlie, the cave kid doesn't like vegetables and it's actually good for him because how much consternation at dinner tables. I mean, I don't, you probably have nieces or nephews or people in your life. You see that like how much stress for parents and kids could be avoided if you don't force your kids to eat pea soup and broccoli and spinach, right? Like if you don't eat your vegetables, I remember vomiting in my pea soup as a child. Like I am scarred. My parents forced me to eat pea soup and I just- It's a lot of trauma around vegetables and children. <laughs> right? So what if- And a lot of fed- lying and lying with parents when they put it in something and blend it into a smoothie. <laughs> and then kids like, and I was thinking kids like hiding it in their milk or like hiding it under the plate or like m- knocking it off the table. Like this is, every kid knows this. If I move the peas around on my plate, I don't, it looks like I've eaten enough of them. If I move the vegetables, if I smash the broccoli, then I've eaten enough of it. So why do kids do this? Well, I think one really compelling possibility is that as children, we don't have these programming and we just know that like that's bitter and I don't want to eat a bitter thing. I'm not really programmed as a child to eat broccoli or kale or spinach. Mm. You can look at these studies. There were studies done in the 1930s and 1940s where they give children a selection of foods, meat and fruit and vegetables and milk and butter and cheese. And the kids essentially go for meat and they go for fruit and they go for dairy most of the time. The majority of the foods they're going to select are fruit and meat. And if you can get your kids to eat organs, you're like their kid's going to be superhero. And that's tricky for both adults and kids. But if we just didn't have to force children to eat vegetables and we just said, hey, you can eat some strawberries and have some grass fed hamburger. And, you know, maybe you have a little bit of a little bit of cucumber or something there for the kid. But just meat and fruit is a great diet for kids. They're going to be happier. The parents are going to be happier. Anyway, it's kind of this idea of like vegetables. Are they really what we want to eat as humans? Kids oh, know God. what's up. Do you know how many times I've thought about you while I eat my vegetables? Because I truly love vegetables. That's the problem. I really love vegetables. And also then I, and I want to talk about this too, but then I think about like caloric density too. And I think about, you know, I think about how much, how many grams of protein should I really be having at once? And I think about just total caloric load as well. And vegetables are not calorically dense. So, you know, I think about all those things, but I really just enjoy vegetables. So as I'm putting like spinach in with my bison that I saute, you know, put in the pan in the morning and then I'm like, "Mm." and then, you know, I'm putting like microgreens on it. And then at lunch, I'm having a salad of like arugula and radicchio and fennel and some onion and, you know, some chicken. And then I'm like, geez, am I dying from the chicken? Cause it's like, (laughs) just like a bird and like not the most intelligent animal and not has really no fat in it. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. And then avocado, I'm like, but is this the fruit? Maybe this is okay. And I'm I just like, I think to myself, how am I killing myself? And I was like, I'm going to be able to ask you. I, I, I find... I find it amusing that I'm like haunting you a little bit. That there's like a little You're like totally carnivore. haunting me. But there's I tell like you what, as I, devil. as I drank my um, my my kefir this morning, I felt I was channeling you though. Yeah, there's like a little carnivore MD angel, carnivore MD <laughs> devil on your shoulders. Like, yes, good job. Or that's bullshit, Danica. Why are you eating that? Totally. I'm like, this salad is such bullshit. I know it. It's going over my shoulder right now. <laughs> it's yeah, just things. It over your shoulder. A couple of things I say to people who say, but I love vegetables. The first thing I say is, do you like vegetables plain? Like, and some people say yes, but I think a lot of people like vegetables because they're in a sauce or because you're putting butter or salt or a salad dressing, which may or may not actually have seed oils, right? So, I mean, when somebody invented salad dressing, it was brilliant. If you go to the grocery store, and I do this all the time, you know this from my social media, and I just call bullshit on everything, but a lot of the salad dressings have processed sugar and seed oils. So of course you like, you know, radicchio or arugula when it has, you know, a sweet oily salad dressing on it, because that is tapping into evolutionary programming. We are still, I think that as 2022 humans, we like to believe that we're like super smart, 
but we are really programmed as the same as the Hadza. We're still 75, 50, 25,000 year old programming in our brains because there hasn't really been clear selective pressure to change us as humans, which means that mm. your body isn't used to the candy bar. When your body sees sweet, it thinks it's fruit. And that's why these sure. processed food manufacturers can really take advantage of this. And they can say, aha, your body is programmed to like sweet because if you were here in the jungle with me, like the only thing that you're gonna get in the jungle that's sweet is fruit. There's no Snickers bars growing on trees or honey. So of course, if you eat something sweet in nature, your body's gonna say, yes, eat more of that. Mm -hmm. um, I like that. That's good for me. And we can talk about the research showing that the fruit is beneficial for humans and even that honey is really beneficial for humans. And then we also have programming that tells us fat is good, eat fat. Like fat is survival. Fat is fertility for both women and men. Fat is thriving. Getting a fatty animal was probably the most celebrated thing in our life, it, you know, in a week, in a month, in a year. The Hadza celebrate a successful hunt more than anything else. And we'll talk about wow. that. So there are all of these programs in us. You're programmed to like fat and sweet and salty things. Yeah. And so what are, you know, what are junk food? Like whether you're talking about Lay's potato chips or Doritos or Takis or Snickers candy bars, they're either sweet or salty or fatty. And often they combine all of them. So it's like processed food manufacturers are really smart and perhaps they deserve props for that. But I think they're leveraging that, that deep knowledge of human physiology and what mm. we crave against us. So we're, we're trying to fight our programming but we need to understand that there are good things that we've always evolutionarily had that will fulfill those needs. And those are things like honey and butter and fatty meat. So when people say I like vegetables, I say, okay, does your, does your vegetable have butter on it? Does it have uh, a sauce? Does it have something sweet on it? Because that's gonna confuse your body. You might say, oh, somebody might say, oh, my kid loves broccoli. And I say, well, did you put cheese on it? And they say, yeah, well, well okay, of course. Like I like broccoli with cheese on it too. I just understand that my body wants the cheese and if I have to eat broccoli to get the cheese, fine. But your body wants the cheese, your body wants the dairy. Right. But there, every once in a while, I talk to someone who says, no, I really just like vegetables. And I say, okay, fair enough. Do you eat organs? <laughs> because I think that there are nutrients in vegetables. And a lot of us grew up eating meat, but very few of us grew up eating liver or heart or other organs that are more uh, exotic, like kidney. And so people will say to me, I crave vegetables. And I say, okay, your body can only crave what it knows. This is just my hypothesis. Like it's only gonna crave what it knows. And so if you are, if you're really not eating a lot of meat, but you're iron deficient, you might crave some spinach because your body's trying to get some of that, you know, inorganic iron. The, the heme iron in meat is gonna be much better for somebody with an iron deficiency. But if you're not eating a lot of meat, why is your body gonna crave that? Because you don't actually, it's not actually in your wheelhouse, right? I so I think that sometimes people crave vegetables because they don't have a full palette of foods for their body to kind of crave and choose from. You know what I mean? Like all the characters on the video game aren't there because we didn't grow up eating organs. But when mm -hmm. I'm with the Hadza, the first thing we do is eat the liver and the heart and the kidneys. And I mean, everything, all the organs come out and the kids eat it and the women eat it. And then we're breaking open the bones for bone marrow later. So it's like, you need to think about all the characters in the video game. And this is where people get a little squeamish because they think I'm never eating organs, right? And there's all kinds of solutions for that, which we can talk about. But those are my, that's my long-winded answer for why you might like vegetables. So do you think, so are you saying that the, from a nutrient perspective that the organ meat can replace vegetables? Absolutely. So if you're talking about vitamins and minerals, I mean, if you're eating fruit for vitamin C, there's nothing in vegetables that you can't get from eating meat and organs. And if you look at it, whether you, I don't, doesn't matter if you want to look at vitamin A or choline or choose your nutrient, you know, zinc or magnesium or whatever, it's more bioavailable. It's usually absolutely more uh, present in animal foods than it is in plant foods. Hmm. We're not really good at absorbing nutrients from plant foods. This hmm. is something I'll say, and this is a really important point. We're often told if you go on like the internet, if you go to the interwebs and you, and you do a Google and you do this search and you say, okay, what foods are high in iron? I guarantee you plant foods are gonna be at the top of that list. And you do a search, what foods are high in zinc? Oh, plant foods are gonna be at the top of the list. But what they're not telling you in those lists is that that iron 
and that zinc, those minerals are not bioavailable in plant foods. You know, there's been studies with zinc specifically, and they give people oysters. You know, oysters are a really good source of zinc. So is liver, so is muscle meat from animals. So you can give someone an oyster and you can see their blood level of zinc rise. But this is a great study. This wouldn't be repeated today because I don't know who would fund it. But then you give someone that oyster with black beans and that zinc level in the blood is just, is cut in half. It only rises about half. And then you give them a tortilla. So you give them wheat with the oyster and there is no rise in the zinc level at all in their body. What? So there are these compounds in nuts and seeds and beans. So wheat is grain, right? It's a seed. They're called phytic acid and oxalates. And they kind of chelate, they bite onto minerals and they make these minerals very poorly bioavailable. So anyone who thinks that they're gonna get zinc from pumpkin seeds is just being misled. You're not gonna get what? zinc from pumpkin seeds. Yeah, you're not absorbing- What about selenium from zinc. Brazil nuts? It's not very bioavailable. What? It's, there's enough selenium in Brazil nuts that you might get some. That selenium is a different type of selenium than the selenium found in meat. This is selenomethionine versus selenocysteine. And the meat selenium appears to be more bioavailable. So I think meat is a better source of selenium than Brazil nuts. But this is a perfect example. Like how bioavailable is the selenium in a Brazil nut? How much of it is chelated by the phytic acid? How much of it is chelated by the oxalates? We know that in terms of zinc and iron, you're not getting it. You're not getting it from almonds. People say, oh, magnesium. I love thinking about magnesium. People say, okay, I'm gonna get magnesium from almonds. You're not getting any magnesium from your almonds because they're so full of oxalates and phytic acid. You're not absorbing that magnesium much at all. So what are oxalates and phytic acid then? So phytic acid is a large molecule. Uh, we could pull up like a Wikipedia picture. Just imagine like a large molecule, a carbon containing structure, a large molecule that chelates, meaning it bites onto a mineral. Okay. Plants use phytic acid to store minerals. They need to store the minerals like phosphorus and calcium and manganese and magnesium because they use those to germinate once the seed actually germinates. Like a Brazil nut is a seed. It doesn't have selenium in it for you. It has selenium in it for the actual plant when it wants to grow into a Brazil plant, right? So the way that it holds onto that mineral is with a compound called phytic acid, which chelates mm. those minerals. Oxalate is another compound it's a dicarboxylic acid. So it's a much smaller two carbon molecule. And it, but it also can prevent the absorption of these molecules by binding to them and pulling them out of your gut. So when we're talking about nutrients, all of these discussions should be framed in terms of bioavailability. Sure. How much of that nutrient can you actually get out of that plant? Because let's just think about spinach. Like when you're eating spinach, do you think, are you eating it because you're like, I'm getting a certain mineral out of it or a vitamin or something? I'm eating it because I do think that there are some, some, some nutrients to it, but I also think that there's fiber in it as well. And so just for regularity and keeping fiber up, I think, well, I might as well add a whole bunch of spinach. It disappears. It's calorically pretty minimal. Um, you can put big handfuls in the pan and cook it down. And it's like nothing. So spinach is actually a really interesting one because spinach is very don't, high. Don't, don't, no, 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 don't Oxalates. ruin my life. You're going to ruin my life. <laughs> Oxalates, knowledge is power. You're welcome. I know. I so want to know. Acid That's exactly is, why I'm talking to you. <laughs> no, it's actually really high in oxalates. And if you go to um, any, so a mainstream kidney doctor, which we call a nephrologist, if you have kidney stones, uh, most kidney stones in the world, I think 80% are calcium oxalate kidney stones. Where do we get oxalate? We get oxalate from things like almonds, spinach, rhubarb, beets, beet greens, very high in oxalates. And these oxalates can accumulate in humans. And we don't really fully understand this. We haven't really studied it because who is funding this? So we know pretty clearly, even I'm going to ruin your life. I'm just ruining your life, Danica. I'm sorry. You know, um, hey, look, my people all know, like, they're all like, what are you eating these days? I mean, this can be like, you know, sweet Haley, who's been with me for 14 years. She's like, so what, what are you eating these days? Because I will evolve my diet based on more information. So, okay, let me have it. So chocolate also is pretty high in oxalates as is turmeric nope. and turmeric uh, powder. Jen, we need to end this interview. It's over. <laughs> That's what I'm, I'm talking done. about. I'm I told you. <laughs> like, so we know there's been studies where they give people, now this is a lot of chocolate. It's like two to four ounces of chocolate. This is like Valentine's Day amounts of chocolates. <laughs> but you can see that in their urine, the oxalic acid goes up to levels that are pathological. You get the amount of oxalate in your urine is the same as somebody with like a genetic condition oh that causes 
oxalate dumping and massive urinary stones and the kidney staghorn calculi. So if you eat, that's with two to four ounces of chocolate. I'm just saying like chocolate has a lot of oxalates and you can push the amount of oxalic acid in your kidneys very high and you can excrete it, but maybe it forms a stone or maybe it deposits somewhere in your body. I see. So there's been autopsy studies also of human thyroids. There's no role for oxalic acid in human thyroids. When they look at autopsies, the majority of human thyroids have oxalate deposits in them. And so the question is like, okay, what is oxalic acid doing in the thyroid? Is it potentially harmful? And then we see lower levels of oxalate in people whose thyroids are affected by autoimmune thyroid conditions like Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So you think, okay, is this is just all hypothesis, but this is the type of thing that I want my work to make Western medicine ask these questions. Is it possible that some autoimmunity at the level of the thyroid is triggered by a reaction against oxalate being deposited in the thyroid? There's no real critical role for oxalate in the human body. It's a waste product. When you break down certain amino acids, you excrete a small amount of oxalic acid, oxalate. But when you dump spinach into your bison, you're just pushing that oxalate up and up and up. And you're just making more and more oxalates to be deposited everywhere, joints, thyroid, kidneys. I mean, this is probably the worst one. There's a whole group of people out there who have vulvar pain that resolves when they stop eating oxalates. It's called vulvodynia. They can't sit, like women can't sit because it hurts so badly <laughs> to sit in the vulva. Like it wow. from, and it appears to be related to oxalate deposition in the, in, the, in the nether regions, in the most precious part, you know, in the most tender regions. Wow. So this is just one of these type of things that says like, okay, is spinach really good for you? Let's ask the question and try and understand how, you know, Danica and all your listeners thrive the best moving forward. There's no nutrients in spinach that you can't get from eating meat and organs. And then if you want fiber, I'm gonna send you some mangoes or papaya from Costa Rica, or I'm yeah, sure in truly. New York. Or wherever you are, you can find bananas or other fruit. There's plenty of fiber. I mean, fiber is a whole separate discussion, which we don't have to get into unless you really want to. But because I'm animal-based now and I'm eating fruit, I think that there's a lot of ways people can get fiber from fruit. Um, you don't necessarily need more fiber from vegetables. And I mean, I think both women and men will appreciate this. I think that most people that I speak to, when they cut the vegetables out of their diet or decrease them, they, they have less gas. They fart less, they have less bloating, their GI symptoms get better, which is just easier to be a human when you can be around people and not have to like sneak over to the corner to like, you know, fart or something. <laughs> I can't say that's a huge problem, but I mean, I'm definitely interested in the oxalate side of things and the part where it makes the um, nutrients less bioavailable and, or, or is actually counterproductive. Um, so, okay. Does this apply basically to all vegetables? I mean, I know, you know, there's some, obviously some doctors that have made lectins pretty, um, pretty, uh, a pretty big conversation piece when it comes to health. I think Gundry's kind of led the way on that. Um, so I have done, a, uh, after interviewing him, I, I definitely steer clear of more of those, but I do get confused then when it comes to, okay, what about broccoli? What about cauliflower? What about zucchini? Well, the zucchini is a lectin. Um, but you know, some of those other ones, is it oxalates being the main thing that is dangerous in some of those other vegetables that make them either, uh, make them, you know, counterproductive in the body? Oxalates are just one of the problems. There's like, there's many issues. So we can talk about the brassica family, which is kale, cauliflower, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, mm, mm -hmm. um, all of Brussels these sprouts too? Greens. Yeah, they're all in this, this brassica family. So we can talk about that. That's a really interesting conversation. But yeah, so let's just define vegetables. So people understand vegetable versus fruit. So vegetable is, and this is actually, you can put on your like DeLorean 75,000 years ago hat. A vegetable is any part of a plant that's not a fruit. So if you think like a plant oh. and you know, and you're rooted in the ground as a plant, you have roots and you have a stem and sometimes the stem is woody Then you have leaves and then you make seeds and the seeds are like your babies. You're gonna encase your DNA in the seed, all the information to make a new plant somewhere yeah. else. It's either gonna get dispersed by wind or it's gonna be in a sweet fruit, which is gonna to drop to the ground and get eaten. And hopefully the seed gets pooped out somewhere else. Or, you know, the, the birds come and they disperse your seeds because they want to eat the fruit. So anything that's not a fruit is a vegetable technically. So you're thinking about, mm -hmm. Vegetables are things like seeds. So grains, nuts, seeds, and beans are all vegetables. Leaves are vegetables. So spinach, kale, chard, 
uh, stems are vegetables, things like celery or what are some other stems? Sometimes like asparagus is kind of like a stem. Um, and then roots are also vegetables. This is just the differentiation. And if you think like a plant, does a plant want any part of its body other than a fruit to be eaten? The answer is pretty clearly no. Like if, if animals go around eating plant leaves and bark and stems and roots, they're killing the plant, which makes it less likely for the plant to reproduce. So like the reason you don't see animals or insects just running around eating all of the plants in front of you, whether it's in Central Park or wherever you are, is because those plants put defense chemicals in their leaves, in their bark, in their roots, and in their seeds especially. That's part of the discussion around lectins is these carbohydrate binding proteins mm -hmm. that are mostly present in seeds. Things like, you know, uh, beans are seeds, right? Those are a big source of lectins. A lot of nuts are problematic lectin containing foods for humans. So. There are lots of defense chemicals in seeds that go even beyond the lectins. There's oxalates, there's phytic acid that we talked about, but there are other defense chemicals in leaves. So in the case of kale, cauliflowers, chard, um, all of these brassica vegetables, you have a whole family of compounds with this complex name, isothiocyanates. And yes, in the name, it sort of has like a cyanide type of thing, and they are related in some ways to that compound. They don't work exactly the same, but there's pretty good evidence that certain that amounts of Brussels sprouts and certain types of kale that people eat contain enough of these isothiocyanates, like one specifically is called goitrin, to inhibit iodine absorption at the level of the thyroid mm -hmm. and create potential for hypothyroidism, which is also called goiter. So maybe you've seen pictures of people in Africa or Central America with the really big thick necks. Have you seen yeah. that? Like the real, yeah. that's a goiter. That's a goiter. And it's from hypothyroidism because these people are eating so many of the foods that have these goitrogenic compounds. Things like cassava, you know, is a common root eaten in Central America. And they're not eating enough foods with iodine. Things like fish or meat and organs of animals. So if you're not eating enough mm -hmm. animal foods and you're eating a lot of plant foods with these defense chemicals that attack your thyroid and prevent iodine absorption, mm -hmm. you become iodine deficient and you get this pathological goiter, this huge thick neck. Wow. And these people are forced to do this because of poverty and they can't hunt and their hunting grounds have been destroyed because they're no longer right. living as hunter gatherers. So this is the concern. And again, this is what my work is about is asking questions, getting people to really think like, is my thyroid healthy? Like, do I check my thyroid? Do sure. I check more than just a TSH? Like, am I having autoimmune thyroid issues, but I'm still eating broccoli? Um, is it possible I'm eating too many oxalates? So the thyroid I is mean, like- I have thyroid issues, so I'm really listening right now. I yeah, mean, I don't know how many, do. I have a lot of things. I mean, I had my, I had breast implants removed. I think that caused a lot of problems. Um, but there's always, it's, it's the, the, as you well know, the body is quite the jigsaw puzzle and like it all, everything connects in some kind of way. So, so I'm really listening in. And also I think thyroid, especially for women is such a thing. I think there's, it's a very, very common issue. So what are some of the key things that have go, goite, go, what's the, well, goitrogenic substances. Goitrogenic substances. What are some of the things? Are, is, are you just kind of covering all vegetables as being a goitrogenic not, substance? Not all vegetables, mostly the brassicas. So okay. the things in the mustard family. Got it. Kale, cauliflower, broccoli, Brussels okay. sprouts, collard greens. Okay. That whole family is isothiocyanates. Mom, throw and the Brussels the, sprouts away. Okay. Yeah, right. So that's like... That's the problem. And people like Brussels. They say like, I love Brussels sprouts. And I say, okay, you love Brussels sprouts because you're cooking them with bacon or you're putting butter on them or something, right? Like these foods don't really taste that good by themselves. And this isn't my, I'm not doing this to like limit people's dietary enjoyment and, and limit the amount of foods they can eat. I'm putting it out there for people who are suffering, who aren't finding answers in other ways. There's this kind of this message that I've gone back to a few times in my social media recently, because I want people to understand this. Like if people are listening to this and you are thriving, you know, you're, you're, you're on point, you're just kicking ass. You've got good body composition and energy and sleep and libido and mental clarity, then don't change a thing. You know, I'm, I don't really, I don't want to be dogmatic about this, but I want people to understand that asking questions is the beginning sure. of healing. We have to ask these questions and be curious. Sure. And the work I do is for people who are continuing to suffer and they feel like they're doing all the right things. They're eating more salads and less red meat. And they're, and they're just, they're getting worse. They're getting more bloated and their autoimmune condition is getting worse. And their eczema continues. 
and I've been there. So that's, that's why I do the well, work. Well, biologically we're all quite different. And, and I'm, I'm right now getting a, a big extensive cool DNA test done. That's going to show pathways for everything. And, you know, so some people methylate well, some people can detoxify some people, some people's bodies are just operate at a, at a higher level when it comes to, um, flushing of, of things that come into the body that are not ideal. And some don't, and I'm guessing I'm probably a don't. So, um, you know, that's probably why I had more complications from implants. That's probably why detoxing is something I really am focused on right now and lymphatic drainage and all those different things, because, but, but I also could be on top of all the things that, uh, all that I could be putting things in my body that are really like slowing this process down. There are many compounds in plants that inhibit detoxification systems in the liver. Yeah. So, do so you I can, so pack? it'd be great to not have to put a castor oil pack on me. That'd be like fantastic. So I just yeah. put one over my liver. <laughs> no, like no, I'm you don't have to myself. do that. <laughs> do you use, do you use black pepper? Yeah. Black pepper is a seed, right? Black pepper is like a pepper seed. So there's a compound in pepper called piperine hmm. and piperine inhibits a big enzyme in the liver involved in phase two detoxification. The enzyme is called UDP glucuronosyl transferase. And the reason that's important is because that enzyme adds a glucuronide moiety to toxins that your body is trying to get rid of. A lot of people think the liver is a filter, but the liver is like a, an enzymatic powerhouse that exports toxins from the body. It doesn't store the toxins like a sieve catching spaghetti, okay. right? It, tags toxins for excretion from the body with glutathione, with glucuronide, right. with other compounds in phase two. In phase one, it transforms compounds to make them more water soluble or prepare them for phase two. So the liver transforms waste products and toxins that you are eating for excretion in your urine and your poop. Mm. And there are a lot of plant compounds that inhibit the liver's ability to do that. So UDP, glucuronosyl transferase, is this one enzyme. Pepper inhibits that enzyme. So one of the reasons that, do you ever take turmeric supplements? I mean, yeah, I okay. put turmeric on, like, I, had, like I, I was told I, my blood test, chicken eggs are bad, so I have duck eggs. And uh, I put like, because black pepper activates turmeric, so you put salt, pepper, turmeric. Do you know why black pepper activates turmeric? I don't know. <laughs> Because the active ingredient in turmeric is curcumin and your body actively excretes curcumin because it's not actually good for humans. <laughs> it's seen as a toxin by the liver. And this is not, this is not opinion. This is medical science, right? So like okay. not everyone agrees with me, but there's, this is, I'm not, I'm not talking opinion. This is, there's papers that show this. Like curcumin is clearly not absorbed much by the liver. Whatever is absorbed, uh, excuse me, it's not absorbed much by the gut. Whatever is absorbed, almost all of it is immediately detoxified and excreted by your body. It's all excreted. And the way it's excreted is by glucuronidation primarily. So black pepper inhibits your body's detoxification of curcumin and turmeric. Therefore your curcumin levels in the body go up. I know people's brains just go like, what? This is crazy. This guy is crazy. No, Listen, no, this is, this is about literally this. how this is. I always joke. I'm like, there's some flax seed and then chia seeds, new flax seed, and there'll be some new chia seed. And like, there's always going to be the next thing. Well, this is, you know, I think, you know, food is this frontier that will kind of never end because we're constantly discovering the body and understanding more. And we're also having more emergent ingredients come from all over the world as we're able to get them and have contact. And um, so I, I think that, no, this is, this is exactly the conversation that needs to be had so that people can start testing for themselves what works and also start looking into that looking into it themselves as well. And, you know, this is a passion of yours. So you're just kind of leading the way on this and, and I'm listening. I'm just kind of, I think I'm, um, empathizing and mimicking perhaps what other people are thinking out there as they listen to it. Like I'm literally collect, I'm the collective for you right now. And I'm the sure empath. that you see it, but you know, you just, I'm just saying that this is how we're feeling is like, really? Oh, you know, and it's part of it is like, okay, my diet will need to change, but also it's a little bit of like, you know, obviously I'm wrong and you know, it's okay to be wrong, but some people don't like being wrong, you know? Well, I think it's not so much being wrong. It's just, there are other 
narratives out there. People sure. live differently. There are other stories. You know, I think that as humans, I want to come back to curcumin and turmeric in one moment. We learned this a lot during the pandemic. We don't like it when our narrative is challenged. We sort of want to understand that we are with a group of people who confirms what we believe and we have steady stability in our worldview and our paradigm. We want to know that we get up and the sun rises oh, yeah. in the east and sets in the west. We want to know that the tree over there has fruit this time of year. We want to know that animals are there this time of year. We want stability. And so when our worldview, when our when our literal conceptualization of what is good and bad for humans is challenged, it's stressful for us. That's a good thing to have happen mm -hmm. because it means we're growing and we question. Mm -hmm. You know, like I don't want people to trust me. I want them to be curious about what I'm saying and to examine all of it and to try and debunk it and to find out for themselves. I want people to think for themselves, but I want them to become curious with this and ask these questions for themselves. That's what we are not taught in medical school mm. is how to think and how to question. And it's just, it's what I want to try and make change within medicine. So I don't want people to trust me. Well, you don't like seeds, them, but you're doing, you're doing, you're planting them. And that's, I'm trying, right? that's a great thing. I love, I love that. That's what I hope to do with this show is plant seeds. And I do it selfishly for myself, but I like to pass along the information. So, yeah. So let's go back to curcumin, specifically to turmeric. So turmeric is a root, right? It's a right. plant root. So right from the outset, if you understand the paradigm that I'm expressing, like that root doesn't want to get eaten. Okay. So there might be defense chemicals in that root, or maybe there's not, but why do we take turmeric? We're told that turmeric contains curcumin, a compound that is anti-inflammatory. But why do we do that? That doesn't make any sense to me. Do you take ibuprofen every day? Do you take aspirin every day? Mm, do you take right. other compounds that are anti-inflammatory every day? Your body has a delicate system. Those are kind of rhetorical questions. But if you do take those things, we can talk about it. But your body has this delicate system of prostaglandin formation and leukotriene formation. Your body heals through inflammation, when you get a cut or a broken bone or a torn ligament, you need inflammation to heal that. We are just now beginning to learn that when you get a broken bone, if you take a bunch of ibuprofen, Advil, you're gonna slow the healing. <laughs> when I was a runner, so I, yeah, I used to be a distance runner. Mm. Um, and whenever I would get injured, they would, they would always say, take ibuprofen. And I said, I don't wanna take that stuff. I don't believe in that. This is how my body heals. And this has been proven now in orthopedic medicine that interrupting the inflammatory cascade as part of a healing process delays the healing and prevents the formation of certain fatty acids that resolve the inflammation. Interesting. So this gets a little technical, but what we know is that if you have inflammation in your body, presumably from a cut or a broken bone, and you take something like Advil, you are going to prevent the formation of the compounds that eventually resolve the inflammation. It's like your body brings in a cleanup crew and then the trucks, they pull the cleanup crew out of there, they get broken because, and then, and then the cleanup crew gets stuck and they just keep cleaning and you just keep this inflammation and like, like you're bringing a crew into your house to repaint. I'm searching for metaphors here, but then the trucks that remove the crew are broken. So you, you they just keep painting and it's just the same thing for good. icing too. Does that, is that another? Yeah, icing doesn't really work. Yeah. So you want inflammation to heal. And so, when people have inflammation in their thyroid or in their joints and autoimmune disease, that is your body signaling to you something is out of balance. Curcumin doesn't fix the cause of that inflammation, but it can damp it down. I'm not saying that there are no plant compounds that have pharmacologic effect in the human body. We use plants for chemotherapy. We use plants for all sorts of pharmaceuticals, but we must not ignore the side effects of those plant molecules. And we have to understand that using a plant to treat the symptoms that doesn't address the root cause is the same thing as using a drug that's given to you by your doctor that most people don't wanna do anymore because you don't wanna give, just take a drug to get rid of the symptoms. That doesn't make sense, you know, it doesn't make sense in terms of intuition, but we're doing the same thing with a lot of these plant compounds. They've just been sold to us as the new sexy thing. Like, oh, there's a new celery juice or the new curcumin, turmeric. It's a multi-billion dollar industry oh, yeah. that makes no sense. It doesn't, it's just like, why would you wanna get rid of inflammation in your body you have to treat the cause of the inflammation. That inflammation isn't just there because you're a human existing. That inflammation is there because something in your body's out of balance. You're both tamping down your body's signal and you're putting a compound in your body that has other negative effects. We haven't even talked about the negative effects of curcumin. And then you're taking, and I'm just illustrating what's happening with you. I'm not accusing you. 
Then you take pepper, which increases the plant compound in your body. And then all the negative effects are magnified from the curcumin. So yeah. there's lots of great papers on this. I mean, there's a paper called the dark side of curcumin. You can look up a paper called the medicinal chemistry of curcumin, and they enumerate multiple issues with this molecule. So I just wanted to talk about curcumin in detail because it helps illustrate this broad paradigm yeah. that we don't really want to be using plant chemicals to treat symptoms. We want to be addressing the root cause. And I think that a lot of times the root cause is in what we're eating. And sometimes the plant chemicals can actually be the root cause themselves. Sometimes well, that's the what I was wondering. Is, is it the, is it the actual inflammation is the inflammation coming from the makeup of the plant, the defense chemicals, the, the nutrients, the, I don't know, non certain nutrients that are counterproductive in the body. So it sounds like that's, that's it's possible. So lectins are a good example here. If you look at the way that these lectins work from like red kidney beans or tomatoes, they open the gap junctions in the gut. Right. So in your intestines, you have these epithelial cells that are tied together with little pieces of protein called, you know, like zonulin is a protein in there and then clodins and occludins. They're zippered together. And these lectins appear to, to cause those gap junctions to open. Uh, gluten is the canonical example of a lectin that opens gap junctions because the molecule of gluten and a fragment of gluten called gliadin looks like a bacteria. It's Our body has this evolutionary program to open the gap junctions in our gut to allow the immune cells to move into the gut to fight infections. If you, I hope this has never happened to you, but if you eat chicken or um, a salad that's contaminated with a the bacteria, then you get food poisoning, right? Oh. Sometimes it happens with rice, you know, at, at, a, at a restaurant or it happens with a salad or it can happen with water yeah. in another country or it can happen with chicken and salmonella or eggs. But then your body, your body is opening these gap junctions. You're getting inflammation in your gut. Your body is fighting off Campylobacter, Salmonella, whatever is in your gut, E. coli. But sometimes fragments of lectins or proteins look like bacteria and they appear to either uh, indirectly or directly open these gap junctions. So yes, I think it's possible that it, many plant compounds could be causing inflammation in the human body by opening gap junctions in the gut. And then we also have to just pause for a moment and say, what is inflammation? I think we throw that word around a lot, but no one really understands what it is. It's just the activation of the immune system. So if the immune system is activated, you have inflammation. It's essentially like all the cells in your body that are immune cells, you have T cells and B cells and natural killer cells, just you know, trillions of cells that are immune cells. And they all communicate with these molecules called cytokines. It's like they can all sort of send these molecules into the air or into the fluid and they communicate. And when that molecular signal, when that milieu, when those communications between the immune cells says danger, there's certain interleukins, there's certain cytokines released, that's inflammation. It's when, um, I don't know, it's, it's almost like being at a baseball game, you know, and everyone is super excited about something. It's like the whole crowd just gets this collective energy. The same thing happens in the immune system, but it's a collective energy that's, that's like, there's something bad out there, we need to go kill it. That's inflammation. So where does that come from? Well, that signal can start in the gut if you damage the gut. And there are lots of things that can damage the gut. Maybe gluten for some people, I think for a lot of people, toxins, heavy metals, glyphosate might do it, this pesticide. But I think that we need to be very honest with ourselves and ask, are there other compounds in plants like lectins and things like this and beans and seeds or other compounds in plants, even beyond lectins, that could also be inciting inflammation in the gut and causing systemic inflammation. Mm. Um, okay, to check the boxes. So your liver, do you take capsules or do you eat it raw? I do both. So you can do whatever. Because you can't tell food. me that like, because you're like, oh, broccoli doesn't taste good. Or, oh, asparagus doesn't, you know, you, don't, you want the stuff on it. And it's like, yeah, same thing with liver. Okay, you can't tell me that actually tastes good. This is interesting. So I, I guess that's a fair point. Um, I think that if you feed a child broccoli at the age of one year old, they're gonna hate it. But you can feed a child liver and a lot of them will eat it. So there's like this programming we have as kids, right? Most of us don't like liver because we didn't have it as children and so it's more irony. I don't mind the taste of liver now. It's a little sweet. I, it's pretty good actually. Um, and I think you grow to like and you liver cook it? taste once. No, I eat it raw. So and you cook it and still get the benefits though, because raw seems much more scary than cooked liver. Like I know that's totally unethical, probably how it's all harvested. But I mean, I love foie gras, which is just liver. 
Uh, uh, right. Yeah. Foie gras is not super ethical, but there are, you can get regeneratively ethical. raised like grass fed, grass finished animals and liver from that. So cooking liver, there are some B vitamins in liver that are that are fragile and will be denatured when you cook them. You'll still get a lot of benefits from liver. I think choline is fairly heat stable, vitamin A. There are vitamins and minerals in liver that are heat stable, mm -hmm. uh, stable, but there's some that are heat labile, which are going to be denatured by the cooking process, which is why, you know, maybe like, that's why I think something like a desiccated organ. So full disclosure, I have this company, Heart and Soil, we make these desiccated organ pills. One of the cool things about freeze drying an organ is you're essentially dehydrating the organ at 33 degrees Fahrenheit. So you're at a freezing temperature, you're taking the water out of an organ. So the idea is you can get an organ that you don't have to taste, but it still has as many nutrients as possible because you're gently sort of making like freeze dried organs. So raw organs, always have a risk. Raw food, whether it's a vegetable or an animal, sure. has a risk of contamination. If sure. your source is good, and especially if you pre-freeze the liver, it's reasonably safe to eat raw liver. Um, but if you don't want to do that, you could cook it, you could sear the outside, maybe the inside is still a little pink. Right, exactly. Um, yeah. And or like chopping it up and putting it in things. Like I buy a, I buy a ground, ground beef that has um, organ meat in it and it's in it. Yeah. You yep, know? Perfect. So I mean, it kind of, you know, it changes the texture a little bit, but it's, it's still like, I'm just, I eat it every week. Cause I'm been watching too many videos of yours and other people <laughs> who eat organ meat. And I'm like, well, this is a good way to get it. So, so, okay. So it's still, it's still good. It's just not quite as good with. Yeah. And when you, a lot of times, unless you are like making your burgers well done, some people will, the burger will be like a medium rare burger. Right. And the center of the burger might have some liver in it that's like a little less cooked. And then you're probably getting okay. a lot of good nutrients. Okay. But okay. yeah, you can do fresh, you can do lightly cooked, you can do cooked, or you can do desiccated okay. um, in the and pills. And then for meat wise, like I had chicken today and I was just thinking you probably were going to say that's bad. What kind of meat is the, you know, I, what is the most healthy meat and what kind of meats do you eat? So those, 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 the answer to both of those questions, I think, is is the same answer because I I try and think about nutrient density, quality of all my foods. So um, this may come as a shock to people, but I think the healthiest meat on the planet now is red meat. And we've been told red meat is bad for us, but okay. we need to understand that that is based on observational studies. And we can talk about why they're bullshit if you want, or we can just accept that there's really no good interventional evidence to suggest that red meat is bad for humans. As many people should be, if you're concerned about the quality of the red meat, get something that's grass fed, grass finished, potentially regeneratively raised, which means rotational grazing, which means that cow is on a field living pretty darn close to the way its ancestors and bison have lived on grasslands for millions and millions of years. So the closest thing that most people can get to eating an animal, which is having its species appropriate diet is a grass fed, grass finished cow. You can also get a bison if you can find bison. There's a great ranch in Texas where I've gone and seen bison and they're wild animals and a cow is related. But if, if an animal is eating, it's really truly species appropriate diet from birth to death, that's going to be a healthier animal for humans. And that's why I think sure. asking questions around what is a species appropriate diet for humans is critical too. So those are land animals. So I think there are more um, free from pesticides, more free from toxins. Now they're not going to be perfect depending on where the cows are raised because there's a lot of places, especially in the U S where there's no pure grass. But one thing I've talked about in my social media that confuses people is pork and chicken is way worse. There are essentially no chickens in the, like in the United States, unless it's a backyard chicken of your friend that is eating bugs and grubs and chicken scraps and maybe some meat from their kitchen, all the chickens out there are fed corn and soy. And if you look at chicken feed, so I'm, I have dogs and I want to, I'm building a company that's making a good dog food. That's just mm. meat and organs. That could help me out so, a lot. Cause I cook my dog's food and it's a bit of work. Yeah, it is a lot of work. So we're working on a company. It's coming soon for a good dog food. But one of the things we're going to do after we make the dog food is we're going to make chicken feed because in our research there, it was impossible for us to find any chicken feeds out there for anyone in their backyard that didn't have seed oils. Mm -hmm. So things like corn, canola, safflower, sunflower, soybean, especially. Mm -hmm. So if chickens are fed soybean oil, 
they're going to hold on to that oil. It gets stuck in their body, just like it gets stuck in us as humans. Yeah. So we know these seed oils get stuck in us as humans. They get stuck in chickens. They get stuck in pork. And that's why I'm not a huge fan of chicken and pork. Now, occasionally it's not the end of the world, but I want to give people what I think is the ideal so that they can use that sure. as a North yeah, Star. Yeah. The same thing is true of pork. It's all fed. It's fed grains. It's fed soy. So bacon is delicious, but... You know, I just posted this reel on Instagram, the death of bacon, and people lose their mind. They just get so triggered. Like, I'm not giving up bacon. I said, okay, don't give up your bacon. I'm just telling you, I don't think it's healthy for you because it's fed corn and soy, and that bacon fat is full of accumulated seed oils. And I don't think humans do well when they have excess amounts of this one particular fatty acid that's found in seed oils, linoleic acid. And we can come back to that if you want, but let me tell you about fish. So fish is pretty dirty these days, even wild fish. And if you look at this, so Danica, I was really surprised to see this, but a study came out recently. It's an observational study, so you can't draw a causative inference, but the association is strong and it really, it really leads to a compelling hypothesis or a concern. There's a clear link between fish consumption and increased rates of melanoma in humans. No way. And yeah, the researchers were very, I think they were just very confused, but it's not confusing because fish is pretty contaminated with heavy metals, polychlorinated yeah, mm -hmm. biphenyls. Oh man, I had such, I had, my mercury level was extremely severe. You know, I, I mostly ate fish for a while and you and Tony Robbins had like exactly. mercury to the chart. I mean, even Joe Rogan's talked about arsenic in his blood from eating sardines. And so fish is a source of heavy metals. It's also polychlorinated biphenyls. And then you have microplastics now, which people yeah. are just starting to talk about in fish. And we don't have any good studies in humans with microplastics, but in animal models, microplastics impair fertility, they impair hormones. They're, they do not look good for, for like life on this earth. And so where do you get most of your microplastics? You get them from fish, you can get them from a sea salt, but now there's microplastic, low microplastic sea salts are available, um, but you're getting microplastics from eating seafood. So. I don't think people understand how dangerous it is to be a pescatarian today. The intention is really good, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm going to be healthy. I'm making an intentional choice in my diet, but you're only eating fish and vegetables and fruit, whatever. But you're, the, the only source of protein is the most highly contaminated source of protein. Even things like wild salmon, there's plenty of mercury in there. I mean, I challenge people to do this, like check your mercury. You can even do blood levels of mercury. You don't need to do a provoked mercury. Just do a blood level of mercury, eat salmon for three or four times in a week yep. and get the best wild Alaskan salmon. And I guarantee your mercury will be double what it was at the beginning of the week. And then don't even check your mercury if you're eating something like swordfish or opa or mahi-mahi or tuna, there's tons. Oh, I get it. I get it. I mean, I love swordfish. I would eat that. It kind of stays well. You can, you know, if you cook too much, you can have more. I mean, I did that and, um, I reached out to Mark Hyman cause it was actually from heavy metal toxicity that got him into the functional medicine world. And basically he was like, just stop eating fish for six months. Have a good day. And I was like, okay. And but wait, let's just also point out, I, I, I love Mark and I, I really want to collaborate with him in the future, but he advocates a pegan diet. Like he is advocating he for a pescatarian vegan diet. <laughs> like, let's just point that out. To there be clear. are a lot of, I mean, like, even when you talk about like, I love him and I think he's brilliant. I mean, da David Sinclair is like uh, definitely advocating for a more plant-based diet and no red meat or less red meat and things like that. And and that's why I think that's just interesting as we, as we propose questions and don't agree on things or don't have the same idea, it's maybe that they, we don't agree. It's just, we're exploring. It's we'll find answers. It's in this, it's in the, it's in these questions that we'll find answers. And so, um, I think that, I think this is an important, um, important conversation to have for that. Um, I'm wondering, you know, people worry about, uh, cholesterol and things like that. And is cholesterol just bullshit? I just have this like intuition that like cholesterol is this old mechanism of, of judging your health. And I, cause I, I don't know. I mean, I have really good high, my, my good cholesterol is really high. And also my bad cholesterol is really high. And, um, I have really, really high cholesterol then. Um, but I just don't know if there's, I don't just, I feel like it's kind of some bullshit. The concept of good and bad cholesterol is total bullshit. Um, 
And I'll, I'll try and explain it. This gets a little technical. Most people will know that canonically bad cholesterol is LDL, low density lipoprotein. Good cholesterol is HDL, high density lipoprotein, but it's much more complicated than that. So we just need to understand that what we are calling bad cholesterol, LDL, is critical for your health, for my health, to make hormones, to make all the sex hormones in our bodies, mm -hmm. testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, mm -hmm. you need the cholesterol molecule that is transported in an LDL lipoprotein. So mm. LDL is a bus. It's like a balloon, right? It has a single lipid monolayer. It's a bus that moves cholesterol, which is actually a steroid molecule, and triglycerides throughout your body. What do triglycerides do? They form the cell membranes of every cell in your body. Oh, shit. And cholesterol is the building block for all of your steroid hormones, all the hormones that we need to live the hormones you need to, to absolutely control sugar regulation, the mineralocorticoids, the hormones of stress, cortisol, the hormones of sexual dimorphism, estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, progesterone those are all cholesterol-based molecules. So we are calling the bus that takes cholesterol to the cells that make those essential hormones bad cholesterol. Like, wait, what? No, that doesn't make any sense. Hmm. There are, there are genetic deficiencies of cholesterol. There's a genetic condition um, called Smith-Lemley-Oppitz syndrome where people don't make enough cholesterol. And these kids are born with mental delay. They're stunted. They have diabetes. A lot of them die in infancy or in childhood. And the treatment for this is basically giving them as many egg yolks as possible. We just give them as much cholesterol as we possibly can because they can't make it. So cholesterol, the steroid molecule is essential. And that little bus, the LDL particle that we call bad cholesterol to move that around is essential for human life. Furthermore, LDL also participates in the immune system. Very few people talk about this, but LDL is an immune particle. Both LDL and HDL participate in the immune system by disrupting quorum sensing, which is how bacteria communicate in your blood. So these particles actually will, will stick onto, they will grab onto the molecules bacteria are using to communicate and pull them out of the circulation. Hmm. So they will help with an infection. And there's good evidence from both humans and animal models that if you give someone or an animal more LDL cholesterol, they fight off infections better. And if you pull LDL cholesterol from an animal or you look at humans who have low LDL cholesterol, they are more susceptible to infections. They get hospitalized more, they get more septic. Now, again, tell me why this is bad cholesterol. Sure. So I think it's more nuanced than this. And this is where things get a little complex. I won't deny that there is evidence that LDL can be involved in the process of atherosclerosis in the arterial wall. But I do not believe, and this is the important statement, I do not believe there is any evidence to suggest that LDL initiates that process or is directly injurious to that arterial wall. Because people will say, bad cholesterol causes heart attacks. Bullshit. Bad cholesterol doesn't cause heart attacks. Bad cholesterol ends up in the arterial wall, possibly there delivering uh, building blocks, possibly there getting wrapped into an inflammatory response. But to say that LDL uh, injures the arterial wall yeah. is not founded in science. So what does injure the arterial wall? What initiates the process? Essentially metabolic dysfunction, insulin resistance, which we know delays wound healing, delays, delays turnover of membranes, and inhibits our production of glutathione, the major antioxidant molecule in the human body. So there is another event before LDL gets wrapped into the atherosclerotic plaque. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, you did a great job of explaining it. And I'll just go one step further and say that if you look at the medical research and you take a selection of people and you just plot LDL cholesterol across the, uh, the y-axis and heart, or LDL cholesterol on the x-axis and heart disease incidence on the y-axis. You may see a curve that goes up in a line. If you just take a broad swath of humans, right? And you say, okay, more LDL cholesterol is associated with more cardiovascular disease. But I think most physicians and most clinicians and even most of the lay public are missing the actual details of that graph, which is the next step of that graph if you take that and you add one more variable to that graph and you graph LDL along the x-axis, right? And you graph heart disease incidence on the y-axis and you split that one line into four lines and you stratify based on insulin sensitivity, 
okay? This is how diabetic or pre-diabetic someone is. And you can use any marker you want. Fasting insulin, HDL is a good metric, right? You can use triglyceride to HDL ratio. You can use any single metric you want and substratify that curve, that line, and you will see a very different relationship. You will see four lines that have completely different slopes. Hmm. And the bottom line will essentially be a flat line. And that is the line of people who are insulin sensitive. That is the line of people who have a low fasting insulin. Yeah. That is the line of people who have a high HDL. That is the line of people who have low triglycerides, who are not diabetic in any way, shape, or form, and have no prediabetes, no metabolic dysfunction. There is no relationship between LDL cholesterol and heart disease incidence in people who are insulin sensitive. Wow. And wow. that is what is being missed by the medical establishment. And you, it sounds like, are going to doctors who are thinking outside the box. When you go to doctors who are regular doctors, who are also intelligent and well-meaning, have you ever had them draw a fasting insulin? Ever? I mean, I get blood draws and I usually do it fasted in the morning. But do they do a fasting insulin? It's almost never, ever done. And that one blood test would change the face of Western medicine because it's such an easy way to tell if you are metabolically healthy, aka insulin sensitive or insulin resistant. But a regular quote unquote doctor, right. not going to get an insulin. Hmm. So we're not even understanding. Yeah. The doctors are not doing anything to contextualize. Well, how much are they LDL even doing levels? labs? Like how much are they actually even just doing labs? Like, I mean, I, what kind of set me on my like aggressive health journey was, um, a year and a half ago having like cycle irregularity. And then I was like, oh, I should probably go to the doctor. And I requested all these labs. Like I was like, Hey, these things are going on. Let's check my hormones. And I mean, I was 39, 38, about to be 39 years old. And it had really not ever been requested of me like, Hey, you know, I'm your doctor. Let's just check these things. Let's, you have to literally go out and seek a functional doctor. And usually you don't do that until something's wrong. Um, there's nothing like nothing in the medical establishment. I feel like sets the precedent that we should all have baseline testing. We should start doing these things regularly at a certain age. Like you have to have something wrong and seek it out. And so I, requested labs. And then, you know, the first time it's, you know, maybe seven, eight vials. And the next time I'm like, let's do more labs. Let's figure it. And now all of a sudden it's 12, 12 vials. And, you know, this one, the other day is 16. And, you know, I mean, if you want to get your food sensitivity test, it's 20 vials and, you know, it takes a lot of effort to actually get information for yourself. I think this is a problem with the way doctors are taught. And it's something I want to be a part of changing. I think that it's not the fault of the physicians. Yeah. Like I said, I think that all the doctors I've ever met, invariably smart, kind, want to do good. Mm. We're just not taught this. Yeah. We're not taught to look for the root cause. We're, we're a part of a system that is based mostly on an insurance model that limits the amount of time you get to see a patient to five to seven minutes if you actually want to be re reimbursed at a reasonable rate. Mm -hmm. You don't have time to hear a story. You don't have time to know what your patient is passionate about, what they are in, you know, what they really enjoy in their life. You don't have time to understand why they want to be healthy or what their disease means to them or what they think is causing their illness. You don't have time to understand how motivated they are to change their diet. They don't, you don't have time to understand what they're eating. You don't even, you, you know, when I was in medical school and residency, you know, like when I'm observing people taking histories, just like, how's your diet? Oh, it's good. Okay, check the box. Like, we don't have time. Uh, you know, I'm in the emergency room at midnight. You know, I don't have, I'm not, I mean, this isn't the right setting to necessarily go into a full dietary recall, but even when I've done outpatient work, there's pressure on you. You don't have time. It's not, the system's not built. Yeah. And I would often try and yeah. understand these things in whatever context I could, but like your physician doesn't really, like they're not educated, number one, to think about diet. Do they know about lectins? Do they know about oxalates? No. Uh, do they know about like the benefits of red meat or the benefits of organs? Are they going to ask you, hey, are you eating liver? They might say, hey, Danica, you actually have an MTHFR polymorphism. You're not really methylating that well and your homocysteine is a little high. Are Said you eating no general doctor ever. <laughs> are I'm you sure eating, they have, but you know, that's are not you getting, you what know, rolls off like, the tip of their tongue. Yeah. Are you eating liver and heart because you need more riboflavin and more folate in your diet? This homocysteine is a little high. Like, hey, your fasting insulin is a little high. 
Um, and just so people know, I think fasting insulin should be less than five micro IU per ml, preferably less than three. Um, but there's, oh, your fasting insulin is about 6.5. Hey, have you been like eating processed sugar or seed oils? Oh, you don't, let me tell you about seed oils, Danica. Like this is not the conversation that physicians are having with patients. No. And I think that's why we all continue to suffer because we're not getting to the root causes right. and understanding all these things. But that's, that's just, just a circle and tie a bow on the LDL. Yes, the idea of good and bad cholesterol is bullshit. It has to be viewed in a context, and that context is your insulin sensitivity. Mm -hmm. If you are seeing a doctor, and I'm speaking to you and the listeners, and, and they tell you your cholesterol is high and you need a statin, but they haven't drawn a fasting insulin, and they're not looking at your HDL and your triglycerides or your hemoglobin A1C and your fasting glucose, then I think they're missing the entire picture. They basically have blinders on and they're looking at one little piece and that is LDL. And so much of Western medicine is myopic like this. And well-known, very intelligent, very respected physicians become myopic like this. Yeah. Well, you know, people in the social media space, like they are very LDL myopic. They just say LDL and or ApoB. If it's high, you need a statin. And I say, that's just way oversimplified. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I feel like it's pretty well known that statins are kind of bullshit in and of themselves. So what if there was like, so to, to kind of wrap it up, at least like I could go on and on. There's so many things I did not ask you about, but like as a final point, maybe to just sort of because you made a great point about cholesterol and fasting insulin level and metabolic flexibility and just metabolic health. So what is the best way for someone to be insulin sensitive? And I know this is probably, there's probably a lot of people listening that don't even know what that means, but you can kind of look it up and just know that being insulin sensitive is important. Um, so what can people do to be more insulin sensitive? And um, I'm kind of hoping you'll maybe add a piece about fasting in there if that is part of the equation, as I'm curious about that myself. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. We can talk okay. about it. So the first step is to know if you're insulin sensitive or not. So get a fasting insulin because okay. that will make it concrete for everyone listening. And if you have a doctor who won't draw a fasting insulin, get a new doctor. Right. I mean, it's literally, even if your insurance doesn't cover it, it's $35. Yeah. Like I almost want to set up a nonprofit that just pays for people <laughs> to get fasting insulins. Like we could do, you know, like, you know, 10,000 fasting insulins would change the landscape of, you know, like we'll just pay for everyone to get free fasting insulins. What you if know? someone has a, what if someone has like, I have a, like a glucose monitor. What if someone has a glucose monitor? Is that going to give you any indication of what not, you're, no, no, you need not enough. Insulin. No, because you, you can't tell what your fasting insulin is based on your fasting glucose. Okay. Okay. Got so it. you've got to get a fasting insulin. So get a okay. fasting insulin. Step one, if it's less than five, then you're probably doing good. I would okay. prefer to see it less than three, minus 2.4. Do you know what your fasting insulin is? I don't. Mm -mm. Okay. Well, when you get it- I'm sure it, it's been tested. We'll, I'll, 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 yeah. we'll do that. We'll do a whole yeah. follow-up and I'll be like, here's my labs. <laughs> <laughs> and I want people to understand that I eat, I eat 200 to 300 grams of carbohydrates a day from fruit and honey, and my fasting insulin is 2.4. That's a whole separate rabbit hole we're not gonna go down today, but fruit and honey do not create insulin resistance. What does create insulin resistance? Seed oils, corn, canola, safflower, sunflower, soybean, grapeseed, peanut. Slip that shit cut, into everything too. Cut, exactly, cut it out. Just cut it out. And processed sugar, not fruit, and not honey. It's really interesting to see that there's a real divergence in the way that quote unquote sugar, whether it's sucrose or glucose or fructose, act in the human body when they are in a food matrix versus when they are stripped out of a food matrix. I don't think many people would question that Coca-Cola and processed sugar is bad for humans, creates fatty liver, creates insulin resistance, but fruit and honey don't do this for a variety of reasons, whether they're involving nitric oxide derivatives or other things that have informational signaling roles in the human body, fruit and honey do not make you insulin resistant. I'm proof of that. There's good evidence for that in the medical literature. So do not fear fruit and honey as sources of carbohydrates. I think those are the least toxic plant foods, sources of carbohydrates, and they're just delicious. So yeah. like, you know, don't worry. They about are it. delicious. Yeah, they're amazing. But processed sugar in Coca-Cola, in candy bars, in bread, in ketchup, in ice cream, and seed oils, in so many things, in salad dressings, in baked goods, in, I mean, I was in the grocery store 
and I picked up a salmon patty, right? This is a salmon burger. I used to eat these when I was a kid. I would love these. A salmon burger made from Alaskan salmon had soybean oil in it, no. right? So definitely, you know, plant-based burgers, plant-based meat have, have yeah. these seed oils. And here's the real kicker, that if you look at the guidelines, the United States government guidelines from 2020 to 2025, they recommend seed oils. What? They recommend, they recommend seed oils because everyone is still stuck 20 years ago in this fear of saturated fat. And they're recommending seed oils. So this is the hard part, right? The dietary guidelines contain recommend seed oils. If you go to a cardiologist, I would say that probably seven out of 10 cardiologists will recommend that you eat seed oils because they lower LDL. We are so myopically focused on LDL that we have lost the forest for the trees. There's plenty of good evidence that eating a seed oil, so replacing a saturated fat, which I would say is healthy for humans, like butter, animal fat, tallow, which is like butter made from cow fat, replacing those fats with corn, canola, safflower, sunflower. We've done this in experiments. LDL goes down, but oxidized LDL goes up. And we know that oxidized LDL is broken LDL. That's LDL that's already been incorporated into a plaque. And there's another marker that is a much better predictor of cardiovascular disease, LP little a, lipoprotein little a, which is a type of, lip, of LDL lipoprotein. That one also goes up. So I don't know how any cardiologist can in good faith recommend a seed oil that raises oxidized LDL and raises LP little a. It's because we've all got these blinders on them. We're so myopic and we just focus on lower LDL we're missing the whole picture. What about like olive oil, avocado oil, that kind of stuff? Right, I can see the turmeric. that like you're just, you're so afraid of what I'm gonna say here. So here's what I would say. The reason seed oils are bad, we don't really understand. That, that's not a seed oil though. They're not a seed oil, but they're not a seed oil, but, but check this out. They, but the reason seed oils are problematic is because they have linoleic acid. So linoleic acid is an 18 carbon omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acid. And in the nutrition space, a lot of people will say a calorie is a calorie. And if you just restrict your calories, you'll lose weight, you'll be healthy. That's bullshit. Calorie quality matters. And different fats have different, essentially hormonal effects in the body. It's like if you give someone estrogen or you give them testosterone, they're gonna have massively different effects in the human body, right? If you give someone linoleic acid and you give someone a saturated 18 carbon fatty acid, which is called stearic acid, those have completely different effects in the human body, essentially in the same way. You know, steroid molecules, testosterone and estrogen are a few atoms different. Like there's just a few bonds different. They look exactly the same. There's a few double bonds different between linoleic acid and stearic acid. They're both 18 carbon. Stearic acid is a saturated fat associated with fat loss, associated with good healthy metabolism in humans. Linoleic acid associated with all sorts of problems in excess. There's a little bit of linoleic acid in meat and a little bit of linoleic acid in eggs, but evolutionarily, people like the Hadza only get maybe 2% of their calories from linoleic acid. In the last 100 years, our consumption of linoleic acid has doubled more than, a, like it's over 150%. We're getting 15% of our calories from linoleic acid these days as humans. It just breaks our metabolism. So there's, uh, yeah. So you're saying that's olive oil then? You're saying olive oil is linoleic acid? No, here's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. <laughs> olive oil is about 15% linoleic acid, right? Seed oils are between 25 and 65% linoleic acid. Avocado oil is kind of like, uh, olive oil, about 15% linoleic acid. Tallow, butter, 2% linoleic acid. So I think that, here's what I say to olive oil. Why would you use olive oil when you could use an animal fat, when you could use a butter, or when you could it's use true. tallow? I mean, because here, because we're assuming that we're not having a salad anymore. That's what I'm talking about, like, because you're pouring So you don't oil. really need olive oil <laughs> anymore. you're pouring olive oil on your salad. <gasps> <laughs> I was talking to Andrew Huberman about this and I said, why are you using olive oil? He said, because I put it on my salad. And I said, why are you eating a salad? And I get it, you want a liquid fat. Here's the problem with olive oil and avocado oil. A lot of them are cut with seed oils. A lot of them are rancid and they're just less stable. If you eat more animal fat, you will feel better as a human. Fat wise then rank your favorites. Cause I don't, I don't know if I've had tallow actually. So raw butter. 
Oh, okay. It's a raw butter. Raw okay. butter. Like no. I actually got some raw butter from a company, but raw raw dairy is not readily available. It's challenging depending what state you're in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So fair. Raw butter is my favorite. Then tallow. Tallow is not butter. It's not dairy. There's no casein or whey in tallow. No. It's it's basically rendered fat from an animal's from a cow's fat. It's like lard, but from a cow. And I'm not a huge fan of lard because that pig is fed corn and soy. Remember, it's going to have lots of linoleic acid. Uh, yeah, so this, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is circling back to our discussion about chickens and about pork, right? That the reason I'm not a fan of eating chickens and pork is because you're feeding them seed oils and their linoleic acid levels in the fat go high. So basically, I think this is my... This is the paradigm that I think is, is going on here. And again, this is my hypothesis. We need to test this, but I think there's a lot of good evidence to suggest this is the case. Humans need a very small amount of linoleic acid, like maybe less than 1% of our calories. You couldn't avoid it. It's in everything, right? It's in, it's in animal fats. So you're eating a ribeye steak that's grass-fed and grass-finished. There's a small amount of linoleic acid. But if you cross over a certain threshold, then things start to get bad in humans. Like it's, it's a dose effect of linoleic acid. It essentially crosses over and you get problems when you have too much linoleic acid. What's too much linoleic acid? We don't really know, but I think anything above two to 3% of your calories from linoleic acid is a problem for a lot of humans. Now, again, this is all framed in the discussion of what is your fasting insulin? The reason I want people to avoid seed oils is because I want them to be metabolically healthy. If you are using olive oil, on a salad uh, <laughs> um, of spinach. Yeah, with spinach. Oh, okay. Kale. You're killing no. me. I don't eat kale anymore. David Asprey got me to get oh, off yeah, kale, good. and I didn't really love kale anyway. Um, but I do. I do spinach and arugula. I think you're going to be better without the spinach, especially because of the oxalates. So if you're if you're eating olive oil in your salad and your fasting insulin is three, whatever, it's fine. Eat the olive oil. Could you be better? Possibly, you know, like you can't really put tallow on a salad. So, you know, is it, I would say like try an experiment without the salad, without the olive oil, maybe you'd feel better overall. So it's, there is something there. So that's why I'm not a fan of olive and avocado oils. It's like, it's just, it's kind of like second class citizens. Why would you not eat an animal fat? I think that as humans, so one of the things we actually make it hard in soil is tallow in a pill. It's called fire starter. And the stuff we hear about this, I mean, you can get tallow in a jar or you can get it in a pill from us. People have like incredible exercise performance, energy and weight loss because people don't get enough animal fat. Women especially, but men too, we're afraid of animal fat. So when we put tallow, when we put high stearic acid tallow in a pill, people can get more animal fat and they feel better. This is what I think, that's why I tell people not to eat olive oil eat more animal fat. Like, and maybe you're getting a ton of animal fat because you're getting a really fatty ribeye or you're eating a lot of butter on your steak or your butter on something else and you're getting a lot of animal fat. I think most people don't get enough stearic acid and other fatty acids that are animal fat. Is the stearic acid why you add butter to meat? Because that's something it looks like you do at every meal is like with your meat, there's butter. I just like the fat. So I want... A lot of the ground beef I get here says it's 80-20, but then when I cook it, it's probably more like 90-10 or it's just too lean. You know, I want more fat. I had a tomahawk this morning. Um, I'm trying to get this thing going called Tomahawk Tuesday. All right. So instead of, taco, do it. Instead of taco Tuesday, I, mean... I had a tomahawk this morning and that tomahawk has a huge thing of fat. You're know, like, I'm not going to put butter on a tomahawk. Or if I have a ribeye that's really marbled, it's a really nice... Uh, grass-fed steak that has marbling, a lot of them don't, then I'm not gonna put butter on it. But I just, I can kind of have this intuitive sense, like I want my meat to be fatty, and so I'll add butter to it. But, you know, the fat on a ribeye, that's gonna have plenty of stearic acid. But stearic acid is an incredible saturated fat. It's so healthy for humans. I mean, like I said, we can go on. I'll just say this real quickly, that there are fats in animal fat that are associated with improvements in dementia and cognitive decline in humans. They're called odd chain fatty acids. There's like all these nutrients in animal fat that we've never been told about. We're just told to fear saturated fat. And it's probably eating more animal fat is probably the difference between where someone is and just like the next level or totally thriving in a much bigger way in their life because we just fear it and people don't know. Like they're not gonna put butter on their steak. They think that's causing heart disease when it's not. It's just making you more vital and you know virile and happy and your body craves that stuff. Those nutrients are critical for humans. And if we replace it all with olive oil, then we're doing ourselves a disservice. I see. Okay, then let me ask another little question here. So 
total protein amount. Like, wait, we didn't finish the loop on fasting. You said fasting is not that important. I wasn't sure if that was part of like metabolic health or not. Um, but is there a certain just general recommended amount of sort of at least intermittent fasting from last bite of dinner until the first bite at break fast? <laughs> yes. Um, I think Andrew and I might disagree on this a little bit. I think there's too much emphasis on fasting in the mainstream medical community. I think fasting is a powerful quote unquote drug that is often overused. So what I've seen often is people will say, if a little bit of fasting is good, then a lot is better. And they'll do one meal a day. And I've worked with people whose testosterone, these are men, goes from 900 to 300 when they go to one meal a day. So clearly eating one meal a day is not good for your sex hormones. You don't want a testosterone of 300. You can over fast. And so, I think that you don't want your last meal of the day to interrupt your sleep. So I think that the best metric that I use is I want to finish my last bite of food two and a half to three hours before my head hits the pillow, right? I, I, you know, But I go to sleep early because I get up early to go surf. So if I'm going to sleep at nine o'clock, that means I have to finish eating by six, right? Or if I'm going to sleep at 8.30 because I'm getting up at five o'clock to go surfing, I have to finish eating by 5.30. So that's a lot earlier than a lot of people do right? But if you're going to sleep at 11 o'clock and your circadian rhythm is in, you know, is, is in check and you want to have dinner at seven, that's fine. Just finish by 8 PM or whatever. And then, and so, and then I actually, you know, I think that for me, it ends up being about a 14 hour fast, I would say overnight, maybe 13 hour fast, because I have my first bite of food before I go surfing in the morning. I actually just have a couple of tablespoons of honey um, around 6 a.m. and then I go surf and then I have my last bite of food, usually around 4.30 or five o'clock, maybe 5.30 I have dinner. So I'm eating dinner a little early because sometimes I go to sleep real early. So it just depends where you wanna be. But I think what I would say to people is intermittent fasting can easily be overused. And I think that you don't have to fast to be metabolically healthy. Like I said, I just got my blood work and I am, you know, my fasting insulin was 2.4. And some nights I have a 12 hour fasting window. I'm not doing 16, eight anymore. I think that's too much to put it into an eight hour window for your food is I think too much for a lot of people. There's actually evidence from some studies that when they look, put people on a 16, eight fasting, the testosterone declined over time in men. Um, so the sex hormones did suffer when they just tried to compress it below eight. So I think for a lot of people, 10 to 11 for an eating window is, is ideal. Definitely you shouldn't be eating and then going to sleep right? That's, I think, the major takeaway there. But I think fasting gets overused a lot. For some people, it's easy. If somebody's out there listening to this and they're, you know, very overweight, great, incorporate fasting. But for a lot of us, for you, for me, like I'm at my goal weight. I don't want to lose muscle. Like I don't fast right now because I'm not trying to overstress my system. And I see that, that I have a stress bucket, you know, like if I'm doing work or I'm working hard, like I'm not gonna fast because that's just extra stress on my body. It's a stressor. So I see a lot of people, especially women who over fast, their periods become irregular, you know, the libido drops and they're just like, like you're already at your goal body weight. Why are you fasting? Well, because I heard X, Y, Z person say, I need to do this for longevity. Like bullshit, you don't need to do that for longevity. You just need to be insulin sensitive for longevity. And we're just pushing ourselves way too far into the stress realm because it is stressful. Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's wrap it up with calories then. Like, so, you know, is it, is there a certain, I mean, you know, when you eat, you, you know, it looks like you, I think you eat like a pound of meat and then there's sometimes some butter on it and there's like half of a papaya and there's like a quarter of a pineapple and there's a tall glass of kefir. There's probably a tablespoon or two of honey going down. Like, ooh, uh, you're touching on something that like at least every girl definitely thinks about is calories. So how do we throw the bullshit flag on calories and what's the truth? What is your, what do you go by? Yeah, this is a great question. Thank you. So there is no discussion of calories without a discussion of food quality. And this to me is the biggest injustice being done in the weight loss realm. People will say calories in, calories out. You know, it's the most oversimplified equation in the world. Like the quality of your calories in affects your calories out. Your basal metabolic rate is affected by what you put in your body. We know this. Like weight loss doesn't happen in the gym. It's good to go to the gym or to go outside and hike and be active. We need BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor in our brains. You need that. You need to be social. You need to move. But that's not where you lose the weight long-term. You lose the weight by getting healthy metabolically healthy muscle that is insulin sensitive. And that is where we get this basal metabolic rate. So 
people who are lean are lean because they have a high basal metabolic rate. And that is just burning. It's just like a, like a wood burning stove that's always stoked. Like as I'm here just talking to you, my body has a high basal metabolic rate because my muscles are insulin sensitive and my body is just burning calories, just turning it over because my thyroid works, right? And you can check this on your labs with a free T3 and a free T4. I don't eat goitrogens. I don't eat isothiocyanates. Hopefully there's not too many oxalates stuck in my thyroid. So I think a lot of women have thyroid issues probably due to autoimmune stuff, maybe due to diet. But then also we know that these polyunsaturated fatty acids, these seed oils can affect our metabolism negatively and can totally change the way that we have satiety and hunger and affect our basal metabolic rate negatively. So somebody could say to you, calories in, calories out, Danica, just restrict your calories. And that'll work in the short term, but that's akin to being in calorie prison, as I call it. And nobody wants to be in prison. Your body is gonna break out of that. Your mind is gonna break out of that in a big way. And that big way is gonna be cookies and donuts and fudge creamsicles and you know molten lava cake, I guarantee you. Like you're gonna break out of calorie prison eventually. So how do you lose weight sustainably? You create high food quality. You create a state of metabolic health. And so I don't really think about calories. You know, I did a podcast with Derek from More Plates, More Dates, and we did back of the envelope calculations. I'm 5'10", 165 pounds, and I probably eat 3,500 calories a day. Um, it's a lot of calories for somebody, you know, and granted people would say like, oh, you're surfing. Yes. I surf two hours every morning. Um, it's effort, but it's not that much effort, but that's a lot of days. That's all I do is surf. All I do is surf two hours, but, um, you know, I don't like, I'm not in the gym six hours a day doing a bajillion workouts. I don't really lift weights that much. I do sometimes, but if I've surfed for two to three hours, I'm good for the day. I might do some mobility. I'll do a couple of pull-ups maybe, but I'm not doing crazy workouts. And I think that this works because my basal metabolic rate is high because I'm eating good food. So I think that it starts with the food quality. And so I think we've got it all backwards. Weight watchers, this yo-yo dieting, over-exercising, which is going to impair your thyroid. Food in a package in the frozen section, but it at least hits a number and it's, it's just all wrong. It's bullshit. If it fits your macros, counting calories, no. Start with food quality and eat to satiety. That's what I say to people. And they're just like, what? And especially with women. And this is, I want to figure out, maybe you can help me with this, how to, how to really communicate this well to women. I think that if women understood that they could eat to satiety, you don't have to stuff yourself, but you can eat as much as you want if you are eating good quality foods. I mean, I think the problem is, is like what I would think for myself is it's like, if it took me as much protein as it, I think it would to actually be have satiety, it feels like I'd probably consume at least 50 grams of protein, you know? And I think that the narrative is that that's way too much protein. You shouldn't be having that much protein at a sitting. And, you know, like I kind of go around 30-ish grams and I need other things. Like 30 grams of protein is not gonna cut it for me. Yeah, why don't you just eat 50 grams? Sounds great, I mean. With some so, more fat, with some fat on yeah, it. That why would don't make you me really happy. I'm Well, because I'm gonna try that tonight, okay? I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> why don't you eat 70 I'll, grams of protein at a meal with some fat? Like, right. So here's the other thing is that people, this is important. A lot of people will say to me, I can't eat that much meat. And I'm saying, well, that's because you're filling your plate with like a bunch of bullshit salad. like. You know, which isn't really, it makes you full temporarily, but then it's not giving you the nutrients from the meat. And granted, the vegetables have some nutrients, but they're not as bioavailable as we talked about, anti-nutrients, other problems. People say, I can't eat that much meat. That's because you're eating a big thing of bread. You know, get out of here with that. So like, this is the thing. And then the other thing that I hear a lot, especially from women, is that they don't digest meat well. And I think, okay, this is also because you're eating vegetables, because we know there are digestive enzyme inhibitors in plants. This is one of the ways plants defend themselves is with digestive enzyme inhibitors. So I say to women, okay, number one, you're probably zinc deficient because you don't eat enough red meat and you're only eating fish and you're only eating chicken because that's what skinny girls eat, right? So you're probably zinc deficient, which means you can't make hydrochloric acid in your stomach, which means the meat isn't going to digest well. The way you fix that is by gradually increasing your meat. And you're probably eating your meat with things that inhibit your digestive enzymes. If you ate a big thing of baking soda, with your meal, your food isn't gonna digest well because baking soda is alkaline. It's gonna completely destroy the acid in your stomach. So you're not gonna have any acid in your stomach to digest your meal. Well, you never do that. That's the worst idea ever, but that's essentially what you're doing 
when you eat some of these plant foods with digestive enzyme inhibitors, things like tannins, trypsin inhibitors, all these, these are in things like nuts and grains and seeds and some leaves. Digestive enzyme inhibitors are in there. They're meant to prevent digestion of the plants in your gut. So if you have trouble digesting meat, try eating the meat without eating vegetables. You can eat the meat with fruit. You can eat the meat with honey or butter. But I think gradually over time, it will start to digest better because you're not inhibiting the digestion. But yeah, people say like, I can't eat 50 grams of protein in a meal, which is about half a pound of meat, which is reasonable. Um, a good start for most women to do 50 grams in a meal would be great. Eat that two or three times a day. And you're going to be, uh, I think you're going to see very positive changes in your body. But what woman gets 150 grams of protein a day? Very few. Yeah, it's tough to get. It's only tough to get. Unless you eat a lot of meat. It's only tough to get if you're eating a lot of salad and pasta and bread and hummus and chickpeas and all that stuff. It's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. All right. Okay. Well then, okay. So I'm, I'm going to have dinner tonight. What should I have? And should I include fruit in that dinner? I'm confused. So I, I can imagine in the morning, maybe it's a little bit better because you'll use it and there's a disposal for the, for the sugar. I'm not worried about the fruit in the evening. You can do it. Like, really? Yeah. Your okay. body, your All body's right. going to use it. Like, remember that like carbohydrates are kind of a signal of abundance for your body. So I think it's okay to signal your body twice a day that you have abundance, that you are in a tribe that's in a fertile area that has fruit on the trees. You know, like it's okay to give your body a signal of abundance. And it's important to realize that sometimes fasting is not sometimes, fasting is the opposite signal. Low carb is the opposite signal. You know, eating plant-based is the opposite signal. You're giving your body a signal of scarcity. And so your body goes, whoa, you're not going to have periods because this is not a time to get pregnant, girl or guy. You know, you're not going to make, you're not going to have a healthy sperm count because there's nothing on the trees and there's no good animals around here. And it's clearly not summer. There's no fruit around to eat. So this is not a good time to make babies. Like, screw that. Like, we're not doing that stuff right now. We're just trying to get through winter. You're either giving, <laughs> you're either giving your body a signal that it's like abundant or it's winter, right? It's And just, I think it's okay to give your body a signal it's it's summer. We evolved at the equator. Like it's okay to give your body a signal of abundance. And then what follows is good skin, good sleep, libido, energy, mental clarity. This is the idea, right? This is what I hope people will experience, but I want them to test it for themselves. So I think you can give yourself fruit at dinner and experiment with how much feels good for you in terms of your satiety and how the digestion is. I've had people ask, isn't fruit going to inhibit the digestion? No, it's not. It's not going to change the pH of your stomach. Your body can definitely handle fruit or honey and meat together, it works out just fine. So right now in Costa Rica, I like papaya and pineapple and mango. You probably don't have those fruits in New York. So if you wanna have like some grapes or an avocado, which is a fruit, right? Um, or some grapes with dinner or some honey with your steak and butter. So I would say for dinner, get a good ribeye steak, um, put some good salt on it, preferably a sea salt. No pepper. No pepper on your steak. No pepper on your steak and then put some butter. But if it's a fatty ribeye, you won't even need butter. If you want to change your world, take a little honey, put it on the side of your plate and put that steak in honey. <laughs> Sweet and salty, baby. Yes. Yeah. So get some honey with your steak, have some fruit on the side, have some grapes. I'm trying to think what else might be in season. Have some banana. Strawberries. It's berry yeah, season. Yeah, have some berries, blueberries, grapes, maybe some watermelon. Yeah. And there's your dinner. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. I think you've just rocked my world and probably the best way possible. I mean, that's the only point of this conversation is that it's about progressing and um, making better choices. So I'll just close with this. I want to bring it first look with the Hadza because I want to say this one thing. So when I'm with the Hadza, you ask them, what is the best day of your life? Right. And remember, this is my hope for a time machine. This is where humans have come from. And their answer is unequivocal. They've given it to other people. You see videos on YouTube of people who visited Hadza. They say the same thing to us as they did to them. It's the day I hunt and kill the biggest animal and I share it with the tribe and we dance and we sing, right? What is your favorite food? It's the biggest animal. It's an impala. You know, you ask a woman, what makes a good husband? He's a good hunter. Okay. Uh, you know, like you ask men, what do they dream about? We dream about hunting. So like, this is what I want people to understand that if you go back in time, we don't know what we find, but I think that the best version, the most appropriate, the most accurate facsimile we have shows humans crafting a whole life around hunting and animals, okay? They craft around hunting and animals and fruit and honey. Those are the things they crave. They don't celebrate vegetables. They don't celebrate leaves. They don't seek out bitter foods. They will eat those things if they are starving, but only in that situation. 
So that I think is a really cool framework to think about this. Like, okay, that made sense to me. That's why I went to visit them because I wanted to see how humans really wanted to get food. And it makes sense intuitively. If you and I are in the tribe in the forest, we're not gonna be looking for bitter leaves. We're gonna be trying to hunt an animal. If we see a ripe fruit, we're gonna pick it. If we see a beehive, we're gonna get honey. That's what we're gonna do. If we starve, we might eat some like roots or some seeds. But most of the time, if we can kill an animal, that's what's for dinner. And maybe a little fruit, maybe a little honey. It's like, it's so intuitive for humans, but we've been sort of programmed out of it. Well, well said. And I thank you for bringing that back around because foundationally, I know that's what kind of set you on this path. So um, I very much appreciate all of your sharing and um, thank you for all of this incredible information. I'm going to have to listen to it again for all the details, but I know now what I'm having for dinner. You got you to gotta let me know. You got to send me an email. Let me know how it goes because I want to hear how this dinner is. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.